Thank you. The final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 16487 in the name of Joanne Lamont on new report calls for more housing cooperatives in Scotland. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons down? I call on Joanne Lamont to open the debate. Ms Lamont, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am privileged to open this debate on the role of housing cooperatives and their potential to address some of the many housing challenges we face in Scotland. May I thank all those who have supported this motion. Thanks too to the cross-party group and cooperatives for producing this report, Cooperatives UK for publishing the report, Shared Space, How Scottish Co-ops Build Communities, and to those including West Whitleburn Housing Co-op who shaped its findings. And may I welcome the representatives from these groups who I know are in the gallery tonight. I should at the outset declare an interest as a cooperative party member and as a cooperative MSP. The Scottish Cooperative Party fully supports Labour's ambition to double the size of the cooperative economy. The cooperative movement is, of course, a global movement with values shared across continents. It's an international movement, but one that delivers change at the most local of levels, making a real and measurable difference to the lives of families and communities. A movement of high ideals, but based absolutely on practical action, empowerment and democratic accountability and control. Its greatest aspirations judged and tested by the real results it achieves. Historically, of course, Scotland was at the heart of the development of cooperatives. Indeed, some might argue we were there at the very start of its development. But this is a movement that is as relevant and central to Scotland's present and future as it was to its past. And as this report so emphatically reveals, these values are absolutely at the heart of the success of housing co-ops in Scotland. This report recognised the flexibility, the variety of housing co-ops, meeting the needs of students, of people in retirement, of young people in work, or of restoring communities which were poorly served, ill-designed, and seen as places where people did not want to live. And as one small example of that variety, we can see the potential of the Edinburgh Students Housing Co-op in providing housing of better quality and at a more affordable level than the other options they might have, a model from which many other students across Scotland could well benefit. I'm immensely proud of the work of housing co-ops in Scotland, and I have seen firsthand the transformation brought about by tenant-led Rose Hill Housing Co-op in Pollock constituency and West Whitleburn Housing Co-op in Cambus Lang. These co-ops have shown how to create change, not just in the kind of housing available, but in how it's planned, how it's maintained, and how their communities are then sustained. These cooperatives understand that housing is not just about the bricks and mortar, it's about the other actions needed to help local communities thrive. Not just the building, but the broader environment, providing services as West Whitleburn does, access to affordable energy, digital services, employment and training opportunities, welfare and money advice. The range of things done in wider action by co-ops is as remarkable as it is creative. Now, from time to time in our debates on housing here and elsewhere, we're all drawn to play a numbers game, focusing for, focusing, for example, on the number of housing council houses built. But that is, in truth, ignoring the reality and diversity of social housing. And it is true that some of our most effective housing cooperatives emerged out of local campaigns by residents determined to take control from their local councils of the decisions that affected them so directly and resolute in their belief that as local people they were best placed to determine and act upon the needs and priorities of their community and their track record proves their case. But the motion does not just celebrate the reality of housing co-op success, it also asks why there is so much unrealised potential, so much unmet needs. Why are there only 11 registered housing co-ops in Scotland compared to 685 across the United Kingdom? This surely is a lost opportunity while too many people are being forced into a private sector option with less certainty, fewer rights and at higher cost. What is the role of the housing regulator? Is there an approach that regulates in such a way that unconsciously or deliberately inhibits the establishment of housing co-ops? Will the minister reflect on this conundrum? Will the minister agree to meet with representatives of the cross-party group on cooperatives to explore how any perceived barriers might be removed? And will the minister be willing to look with the group at how the recommendations of this report might be progressed? How can we promote and advocate for the housing co-op model more effectively? 
and as a consequence see an increase in the number of co-ops across Scotland. I am proud that the Labour-led administration very early in the life of this parliament established Cooperative Development Scotland to promote cooperative models in the economy and in our communities. And at that time, we deliberately chose to exclude housing from its remit because housing was located in Community Scotland, an agency focused on community and economic regeneration, but with at its centre housing expertise, which had done immense work to improve Scottish housing. Now, Community Scotland is long gone, but the need for an advocate for co-op housing remains. And I would urge the Minister to confirm the willingness to have the remit of Cooperative Development Scotland opened up to include housing, giving it responsibility for willing the means to increase the number of housing co-ops with all the benefit that would surely bring. The evidence is there as proof. In conclusion, I would underline again my admiration for all those involved with housing cooperatives who have transformed communities with focus, vision and determination. We have at our hands a means of enriching our housing provision and our communities and a means of unleashing that potential further. I look forward to being part of future action to remove the barriers placed in front of housing co-ops and allowing them to flourish. Can I thank you again to those who produced the report and to all those co-op tenants who have inspired in the creation of co-ops um, and continue to inspire by their work. I trust that the government will recognise the key role of housing cooperatives, look at this report and act with all those who have an interest in this to ensure that housing cooperatives can continue to serve our local communities. Uh, thank you, Ms Lamont. And can I gently say to the public in the gallery, I do understand why you want to applause, but we do, we do not permit applause from the gallery. Thank you. Uh, I now call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Graeme Simpson. Mr Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And let me uh, start by congratulating uh, Joanne Lamont on securing this debate. And unusually, not words I often say, uh, also congratulating uh, James Kelly, who I see uh, from the report uh, is the author of the foreword uh, to the report. And a very excellent report it is too. And I think it does Parliament uh, considerable credit that a cross-party group can produce such a substantial contribution to a very important uh, part of uh, our debate. And in her remarks, uh, Joanne Lamont uh, referred to the uh, imbalance in the number of housing co-ops in Scotland compared to south of the border. I, I'm never afraid to pick up good ideas from wherever they come, including uh, south of the border. And I turned immediately uh, to section eight in the report uh, to have a look at what it says there. My brief contribution, I won't explore it in any great detail, but I think there is a considerable amount of things to say. The cooperative uh, movement in housing is an important uh, part of uh, creating housing uh, for people across Scotland. Um, it can contribute a great deal to fill the gap uh, that Scotland has suffered from, as the rest of the UK has, uh, since the right to buy was introduced in 1980, resulting in 2.6 million houses across the UK being sold out of public housing stock. And the cooperative uh, housing associations can play their substantial part in creating housing for people who otherwise are going to find it difficult outside the private sector, where it's very expensive often and not always of good quality, uh, to have the kind of living space that's essential uh, for people who want a good standard of life. Um, rent prices are going up. Uh, people are being encouraged to invest in uh, buy-to-let properties, where the primary focus uh, is for the landlord's interest in making a profit. When you have a cooperative, the people who live in the cooperative uh, housing are the people who are the centre of the decision making. And I think that's right, proper, and unlocks potential uh, for many people who otherwise, in too much of their lives, have little opportunity uh, for their voice to influence important things in their life. So cooperatives in general and cooperatives in housing can make a particular difference to the quality of life of the people who live in them. And of course, it's a neighbourly way, a collaborative way of making decisions that can encourage social bonds and collective responsibility, and that strengthens society uh, as a whole. And when 
collectively people in cooperative housing decide on what their priorities are for their area, the whole area has something that is an example uh, right across uh, communities. And I was particularly interested in the example that's been uh, drawn on here, the uh, Whitlaw Burn Co-op, which extends far beyond simply the provision of housing. Joanne Lamont uh, referred to uh, the provision of power uh, and frozen power bills that come from that, addressing the fuel poverty issue, which of course has been before us uh, this week in Parliament. For young people in particular, uh, there is a challenge. The number of who are living in rented accommodation has risen compared to my generation and others who followed me. So it's important we get the appropriate balance between privately owned and social uh, housing. And cooperatives can play a very important part uh, in that strategy. Uh, presiding officer, I think uh, it was the communities committee that Joanne Lamont and I were both on, she was the convener, I was a humble backbencher. I remember that time occasionally with fondness. Uh, sometimes I remember the robust engagement that Joanne Lamont had with the issues before the committee, as she always does. And I congratulate her once again, presiding officer, in bringing this important topic to Parliament and giving us the opportunity to discuss. And I congratulate all the cooperatives and their members, presiding officer. Thank you very much, Mr. Stevenson. I call Graham Simpson to be followed by James Kelly. Mr. Simpson. Thank you very much. And can I also congratulate uh, Joanne Lamont for bringing this debate to Parliament. Um, it's, it's an extremely uh, important issue, and I'm a huge fan of housing co-ops. Um, but I have to say, we just don't have enough of them in Scotland. Um, if we only have a, a 11, that's, uh, that's nowhere near enough. Um, the, the issue has uh, not just come up at the uh, cooperatives cross-party group, it also one, one of the several uh, cross-party groups that deals with housing has also discussed it. Um, so it is on the agenda across the parliament. Um, I read the report with interest. It was a very, very good report, uh, very illuminating. Uh, and I focused in um, on the case study uh, with, well, of Wes Whitlowburn in Cambers Lang uh, mainly because that's, uh, well, A, a very good, uh, uh, a very good project, uh, and B, it's just down the road from where I live, so I know where it is. Uh, and if the people in, in, in the gallery want to invite me along to see it, I'd be happy to come down, come down the road from East Kilbride. Now, they made a, co a comment uh, in the report, which I thought was very telling. I'll just read it out. It says, the attitude of local authorities is uh, another barrier we are in South Lanarkshire, and there is no history of or appetite to transfer council housing stock to community level, no appetite to give up control. Glasgow is supportive of the idea of housing co-ops, but doesn't have the stock. South Lanarkshire and others have the stock, but don't want to continue as a social, uh, but want to continue as a social municipal landlord. West Whitlawburn is sandwiched between two local authority estates, which are failing abjectly. They're dreadfully managed and maintained. There is no tenant input or participation, no transparency. Now, I think that sums up the problem we have here. It's a, a, a problem of culture. Um, in some council areas, uh, they name South Lanarkshire, um, the, 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 the issue is they do not want to give up control. They want to keep the power. They have a we know best attitude and I think the, the, you know, the tenants at West Whitlow Burn have shown that councils like South Lanarkshire need, do need, they need to give up control and accept that they should, ha should be more flexible because housing co-ops have uh, a great deal of benefits that can deliver affordable housing, help to create and build powerful communities, offer tenants far greater control over the things that matter to them. And as uh, Joanne Lamont said, you know, they've got far, they doing, seem to be doing far better at this uh, in England and Wales. Um, we've only got 11 uh, housing co-ops, 685 across the UK. So you have to ask, well, why is that? What's, what's holding us back here in Scotland? Part of it is, is, is the culture, uh, as I said. But down in England, um, the, 
they've got a community housing fund, which is a national program to develop a range of community-led housing. That's going to run until 2021-22. Uh, in Wales, they've got the Welsh Cooperative Housing Development Company, which is putting in 50,000 a year for three years to promote support and increase the number of housing co-ops in Wales. So I think if things are uh, progressing better in the rest of the UK, maybe the Scottish Government uh, and the Cabinet Secretary could perhaps uh, say something about this when she speaks. Maybe the Scottish Government should be looking elsewhere uh, and seeing what's happening in the rest of these aisles and maybe taking on board what's happening and, and uh, doing it here in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call James Kelly to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Mr Balfour is the last speaker in the open debate. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I join other speakers in congratulating John Lamont in securing this important debate on housing co-ops. Can I uh, thank the members of the cross-party group and co-ops for the work they've put into producing the doc document shared space, and can I welcome the members from a number of housing co-ops, including uh, West, West Whitleburn, who are in the gallery uh, this, this evening. This is indeed uh, an important debate and an important issue. And, you know, I think reflecting on it, I first spoke about housing co-ops shortly after getting elected as an MSP in, in 2007. Uh, and indeed, I, I mentioned West Whitleburn then. But when you look at the stats in the motion, and the, well, there's only 11 registered housing co-ops in Scotland, uh, I think that's a matter of deep regret. And when I reflect back on that early speech that I made, I realised that in that 12 years t time, there's been very few uh, newly registered housing co-ops in Scotland. So we've very much become left behind um, by that model. So I think the, the question you've got to pose is, um, you know, is that a good or a bad thing? And I, th I would certainly submit it is a very bad thing. And in doing so, I uh, give the example which is quoted in the report of West Whitleburn Housing Co-op, uh, which I've observed very closely, uh, and not just because it's the area that I represent, it's close to where I stay. So it was set up in the 1980s. They took over the housing stock from Glasgow City Council. The reality was the housing stock at that time was in very poor uh, condition. There were a lot of uh, antisocial behaviour issues, and uh, it was a very, the, the reality was that West Butlerburn at that time was a very challenging area. Uh, if you go to West Butlerburn now, you'll see that the, the area has been transformed. Not only has that, that original housing stock still there, um, but it, you know, it, it has been, uh, it has been modernised um, to such an extent that uh, the, the, the demand for uh, places uh, is great on the on the housing waiting list there. But no, it was not just a case of renovating the existing stock. There have been new builds. There's been a community centre uh, taken on. Uh, there's also been a communications co-op as well as an initiative to secure low energy prices. Uh, as in addition to all that, uh, rents run at a, a very competitive level compared to other housing providers um, in the area. So it's a fantastic example of how a local area can be transformed by a housing co-op. Um, and uh, it's down, the secret of it is down to the community involvement. Um, the main due to the committee, many of whom uh, go back to the, the early days, particularly Anne Anderson, who is in the gallery tonight, and also the strong leadership from working in cooperation with Paul Farrell, the director. So I think the challenge uh, going forward is, as we've got 150,000 people on social housing waiting lists in Scotland, uh, are housing co-ops something that can contribute to tackle the housing issues that we face in Scotland? And of course they are when you see the difference that that's made uh, in West Whitleburn. And the fact that there are, there are only 11 in Scotland compared to 685 in the, the rest of the UK shows that you know, we really have, have been left behind. So I think that the direct challenge, I would say, to the, the, 
the Cabinet Secretary and the Government is uh, this debate should not just be a talking shop. Uh, I would urge that the Cabinet Secretary engage with the, the cross-party group, engage with the experts in housing cooperatives because they present a, an opportunity and a solution to some of the challenges that we face in housing. So I, ho I, 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 I hope that the Cabinet Secretary, when she closes, uh, will respond positively and take some practical steps to place housing co-ops at the centre of solutions to the housing issues in Scotland. Thank you, Mr Kelly. I call Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. We, this debate is set in the context that Scotland's housing is far from good and many people are struggling as a result. There are 150,000 people on council house waiting lists. Rents are continually rising and people are finding it increasingly difficult to find not just affordable housing but appropriate housing. Given that context, housing cooperatives are able to play an incredibly valuable role in elevating some of the issues that are facing the thousands of people looking for a home. I, I have to confess, President Officer, that before this motion uh, was put down, I knew little, little about housing cooperatives. And for me, it has been a very interesting learning experience. As other speakers have already said, uh, here in Scotland, uh, there are only 11 compared to over 600 across the United Kingdom. But the thing that I think uh, interests me most is the community aspect of a housing cooperative is a huge strength for this type of housing. Community is essentially built into the design of a housing cooperative, given its nature of group of living and decision making. Here in Brunchfield, uh, just a few miles, there is one consisting of eight people living together of all ages and stages in a large terraced house. Tenants from this co-op had detailed in the Shares Spaces report by the Cooperative UK that the genuine community that they have gained from living was a hugely beneficial. This can be an alternative living option for older people who, for example, may be retired, living alone, or having gone through life-changing circumstances. According to Age Scotland, 100,000 older people in Scotland feel lonely or most of the time, and communal living could be a remedy for some of those individuals. Therefore, pursuing the establishment of more housing cooperatives could not only help meet the demands of housing shortages, but also reduce the levels of loneliness in Scotland. People who have a disability are further disadvantaged when it comes to finding housing and suitable housing at that. Housing cooperatives could, do more, could be more of an option for, for those who need specific adjustments to their home, but not have them supplied by the council. For example, Andy Dufflin and his daughter, who is in a wheelchair or Whitlaw co-op, were able to move into a flat there that catered for his daughter's specific needs. Given again with a communal ownership, structure of a housing cooperative and the way decisions are made, it may be much easier for suitable adjustments to be made rather than have to join long queues that councils often face. Finally, there is the economic benefit to housing cooperatives. Given that collectively in the UK, housing cooperatives have a turnover of £642 million. It is also housing that is more accessible to those who cannot afford the rising rents and housing prices, provide an alternative to temporary accommodation and the seemingly never-ending waiting list. Ultimately, pursuing the creation of more housing cooperatives should be part of the Scottish Government's way of addressing housing needs. I welcome the further inquiry into how this can happen. And again, I congratulate the motion being debated this evening. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. And I thank you, Mr Balfour. And I close on Eileen Campbell to close the Government Cabinet Secretary, please.
Thank you, President Officer. Uh, and I, like others this evening, welcome this debate and sincerely value the contributions from all the members who have taken part in it. And I think it has been a really, really constructive and really informative debate. But in particular, I would also like to thank uh, Joanne Lamont for highlighting the publication of the report acknowledging the valuable contribution that housing uh, cooperatives provide in the delivery of affordable community controlled housing in Scotland. But more generally uh, and more broadly, also highlighting the importance of the cooperative movement to public life, a movement which to kind of paraphrase what she said with high ideals, but rooted in empowerment and fairness. And certainly as the member representing Clydesdale, which also houses uh, and homes uh, New Lanark, which had uh, Robert Owen playing a pivotal part in that and is considered to be the, the father of the cooperative movement, I certainly recognise the, uh, the value that she attaches to uh, cooperatives in many other uh, areas of, of life and not just in housing. But I, also, also, I would also like to congratulate West Whitleburn uh, Housing Cooperative in Cambus Lang and as I think it celebrates its 30th anniversary for all of its achievements in creating safe, warm and more attractive homes for its tenants. 30 years of really positively uh, impacting on the lives of, for many generations and who deserve our thanks for their dedication uh, and commitment and I'm really also very pleased to see uh, many of them here this evening. Coincidentally, though, I, uh, this morning I attended the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations annual conference in Glasgow. Uh, as the national membership body for housing associations and cooperatives in Scotland, their ambition is that everyone has a good home in a successful community with a range of high quality, affordable and accessible homes that meet people's changing needs and aspirations throughout their lives. And this ambition reflects our view that housing is central to our shared endeavour to build a fairer Scotland, certainly more than just bricks and mortar. Uh, housing supports our ambitions to embed the place principle at the core of how we work, an approach that seeks to ensure that we make better decisions that have people and communities at their heart to deliver positive outcomes. Crucially though, it recognises that local decision making and delivery, informed by the people who live and work there, the experts in their community, are key to the social, economic and physical success of places. And I know that this inclusive and cooperative approach is embedded throughout the social housing sector in Scotland. And indeed, Joanne Lamont and, and many others made that point. It's a diverse sector where housing cooperatives are one of several social landlord constitutional models who are delivering good quality houses and services to their local communities. The housing cooperative model has remained relatively small in Scotland because unlike other parts of the UK, we, have a, we do have a strong tradition of community controlled housing associations. Cooperatives, along with these associations, play a really important role delivering local, democratically accountable, affordable housing and services to local communities. And given the significant tenant involvement in housing associations in Scotland, there hasn't been the demand by tenants to grow the cooperative housing mood model here. But I'm really happy to further engage with Joanne Lamont to understand the barriers that she feels may be there unintentionally that stymies that demand. Because this government is committed uh, to uh, delivering house, uh, affordable housing and we uh, have committed to delivering at least 50,000 affordable homes over the course of this parliament with 35,000 of those for social rent. And to achieve that, we're investing more than 3.3 billion in our affordable housing programme, the single biggest investment in affordable housing since devolution. Of course, yes, absolutely. I um, appreciate very much your willingness to meet with the cooperative part, um, the co-op uh, cross-party group because there are a range of issues that we'd be aware of but I wonder if the Minister or the Cabinet Secretary would outline the funding round the wider action work that is done by housing cooperatives in particular because the lesson in Glasgow and elsewhere is it's not enough just to build houses because you end up knocking them back down again later because you've not built in the thing that sustained the communities in which these houses are built. It, absolutely, and that's why I mentioned the place approach, because making sure that we don't just build houses, but it's the spaces in between the spaces to enable children to play, that they're warm, they're safe, that enable children to uh, comfortably do their homework, uh, that enables people to live independently into their elder, older life, uh, and to make sure that we have those spaces to enable communities to engage with each other uh, as well. So absolutely, as I take on board what Joanne Lamont says, this is not just about bricks and mortar, it's much more important than just that. And we need to not just build houses, but we need to have sustainable communities as well. And those are all aspirations that are rooted in the national uh, performance uh, framework. Um, and I just want to though, point out, though, that the, the commitment to the delivery of affordable housing 
the official statistics published yesterday that show that since 2007 that we have delivered more than 86,000 affordable homes, including 59,000 for social rent, a significant achievement to show, ensure that folk have quality ho the homes that they deserve. And since 2007, this government has taken a range of actions to improve housing outcomes for the people of Scotland beyond those uh, ambitious targets. And we're certainly proud of that record. We ended the right to buy. We uh, introduced the social, uh, Scottish Social Housing Charter and the Independent House, uh, Scottish Housing Regulator, strengthened tenants' rights in the private sector by introducing the private residential tenancy. We fully, fully mitigated the bedroom tax through discretionary housing payments, introduced universal credit to Scottish House Scottish Choices and have worked to cut household bills by improving energy efficiency and tackling fuel poverty. We also, though, have a strong tradition of involving tenants in decisions about their homes and communities as the own, and we are the only country in the UK where there is a statutory basis for tenant participation. And that's a really important point to make in this debate. The Scottish Housing Regulators reports on the Scottish Social Housing Charter show that 9 out of 10 social housing tenants are satisfied with the homes and services their landlord provides and with the opportunities that they have to participate. And the Charter is continuing to deliver good outcomes for tenants and services users and I'm really pleased that the regulator report confirms that it is working and delivering better services and standards year on year. But while that does uh, show that there has been lots and lots of progress that has been made, we're certainly not complacent and we certainly understand that there's still much more to be done. So turning to the future, when the First Minister launched our programme for government last September, we made a commitment to plan together with stakeholders for how our homes and communities should look and feel in 2040 and the options and choices to get there. And since then, we've been uh, engaging extensively with a variety of stakeholders, including housing associations, cooperatives and tenants to help shape a draft vision and principles for 2040. And we'll undertake further consultation with stakeholders on a draft vision, themes and outline options in the autumn. And the output from this next round of consultation will help us to inform the vision and route map to 2040, which we will publish. But let me le reiterate our desire for this to be a shared vision with widespread support from all housing sectors and across the political spectrum. And again, I would happily meet with uh, Joanne Lamott, with uh, James Kelly, Graeme Simpson, anyone who wants to further make the point that cooperatives need to play a full role in shaping the future housing system in this country and I hope that that offer is received with um, the kind of spirit that it's intended to make sure that we can collectively work through what all of our collective vision is for housing in Scotland and how in this instance cooperatives can play its part in doing so because the, this is an opportunity and it's a real time to reimagine a housing system and create a vision for housing between now and 2040. And to do that, we need to build on that collective wisdom of our wide and varied uh, housing sector. And I would certainly invite the CPG to send in their views into that process. So in conclusion, presiding officer, housing cooperatives play an important role along with housing associations and local authorities in meeting our housing aspirations and ambitions. And we really do welcome the report shared space uh, from Cooperatives UK because it does provide a really valuable contribution to the debate on creating a vision for housing between now and 2040. And again, congratulate Joanne Lamont for bringing this debate to Parliament, uh, but also importantly, uh, thank the cooperative members who have attended this evening. And I hope that we can also ensure that their views and their expertise are also captured as we shape our new housing system for Scotland's future. I, again, thank you uh, sincerely to everyone who's taken part. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting of Parliament.